Hello, uh, everybody. Um, this is Adele reporting uh, for the month of June. I have made some notes so that I don't forget anything that I really need to cover. Um, what, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give an overview, an update of um, all the various aspects of work uh, in the None in Three project for the last month. And then I just want to talk about a, a couple of issues that um, have been particularly challenging uh, in terms of, uh, of my role. Um, well, first of all, to say that the, um, the PIT meetings, project implementation team meetings, have, um, have continued uh, to go well. They're organized monthly, so we have one coming up on Monday, and the minutes of each meeting taken by Vicky and uh, sent out in advance so that we can address any matters arising in the meetings. Uh, with regard to reporting, uh, we have managed to get everybody to comply with the reporting requirements. I, I have issued a request to all leaders uh, of the various work packages um, to, be, to be more responsive to the needs um, of the reporting requirements. By that I mean uh, not to, for Vicky not to have to keep chasing up uh, reports that may be late. I have to say it, it, most people are getting their reports in on time or explaining that they would be a day or two late, but it does take a lot of Vicky's time to be chasing up reports uh, that are missing. And I hope that by now the reporting requirements are really quite clear so that what we have at the end of every month, we have to complete timesheets, which are then due on the first of the next month. By the middle of every month, we produce a video report, and every quarter that is turned into a narrative report using the EU template. Uh, these are basic reporting requirements, and the time frame doesn't change from month to month. So hopefully things will be much smoother from here in. Uh, in terms of game design, things are definitely where they need to be. Uh, Dave hit the ground running from his appointment last month and uh, has produced some very exciting ideas together with Eunice uh, in the process of consultation and revisions. And as Dave uh, and Eunice will explain in their report, this is a process of constant iteration where things have to change and be updated all the time. The, uh, the survey is also where it should be uh, at this time, uh, the, according to the, the time plan for the project. Uh, so that is now out for consultation and will be the focus of our, our next PIT meeting on the 20th of June. There have been some issues in relation to the qualitative research, uh, which I'll come back to. Uh, but in terms of research, just to say that Ina has recruited a new team for uh, helping out with the survey, somebody who will be based in Barbados and working with us uh, in terms of Dan's work. Regarding public engagement, well, I think you will all hear from Ryan, Zanita and Megan, uh, which will give you the detail. Uh, we have uh, made some decisions regarding the film that we're going to produce. That is going to relate to the game and also to children. So it's going to be an educational film and a funding application is currently um, in process for that. Um, Instagram, Twitter, website, Facebook, our major public faces for the project one of the things that I'm really pleased to report this month is how responsive uh, that we've been able to be regarding local context. So this month there was a particular issue regarding um, the abuse of an elderly woman and we responded to that by making elder abuse a theme for this month's activities. And you will see when you hear from Megan and Zanita, you will uh, and Ryan, you will see how, um, how we were able to capture people's perspectives on elder abuse. So the landing page for the website focuses on, web, on elder abuse. There's a lot of information there. It talks about elder abuse generally, but it also then talks about specific developments in the Caribbean. 
Uh, we had a meeting regarding the August conference and I was very pleased to meet with the Barbados team. Essentially, they are going to be the hosts for this event. So it was really important to involve them in what is happening. The latest update on that is that I have been successful in getting some more funding and it looks as if we may be able to take most of the team from Huddersfield uh, to meet in Barbados. And this has become very important because what we want to try to do is to sensitize people in Huddersfield to the local context for this research project and being in Barbados, meeting with stakeholders, meeting with the Barbados team and the Grenada team who are coming across, all of that is going to be very important uh, for raising awareness. Um, I said there had been some issues regarding the qualitative research and I just want to talk a little bit about that. We, this month sees the end of gathering data for the qualitative research. In July we move to data analysis and reporting and in August we have to have a report on findings to present at the conference. We have been trying to carry out research on a very, very sensitive topic with groups of women who are particularly marginalized and vulnerable and it has been extremely difficult to reach some of those groups of women. We've had great difficulty in Barbados in reaching women in same-sex relationships who experience domestic violence. Less difficulty with that group in Grenada. We've had great difficulty uh, in both countries in reaching uh, young women who are pregnant and have been exposed to domestic violence. We're still continuing with that. But perhaps the area that's caused us most concern is reaching women who are trafficked and are exposed to domestic violence. This group of women are in highly uh, precarious positions, subject to a high level of risk and danger, and it became apparent that not only were they difficult to reach, but that reaching them was placing them in danger and placing the researchers in danger. We had to make some decisions. We, we considered the risk um, that we were posing to both women and researchers. And we had to make a decision as a team that we would no longer pursue this avenue of inquiry. Um, we are very saddened by this and we, we, do, we have managed to capture um, at least one interview uh, with a young woman, which really does reinforce what I'm saying about the dangers and the risks. Uh, we're really sad about this because it means we don't have the information that we wanted to get from the perspectives of women themselves. But we always have to remember that research should not be at any cost. We have a duty of care to the people that we're attempting to find out about. And if our research puts them at risk, then we have to say no. And so we have decided not to pursue uh, this particular group of women and we will instead attempt to address their needs in other ways. So that's been a major decision that we've had to take. With regard to um, our research with men and with youth, in Barbados that has gone particularly well. In Grenada we have produced some very valuable information but it has been particularly difficult to reach men who are known offenders of domestic violence. And we haven't given up on that, we're going to continue and hope to have our complete data set by the end of August. But those have been the kind of major challenges um, for this month. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, here is my audio report for the month. It's June 15th. This is Hazel. So this month, I've focused exclusively on research interviews. As I've shared before, this is really proving infinitely more challenge, challenging than, than I ever imagined. Finding subjects in the field on my own proved to offer some ethical challenges, but working through state offices or NGOs, that offers challenges of other kinds. 
Um, I may have mentioned before that the NGO community is a star community in Grenada, star. I single out Gren Chap and Gren Aids as two that work at a very high level of efficiency. There is a woman called Kizzy Ann Abraham and she is she's incredible. And she's on my advisory team in Grenada and they're they support the those two agencies through her. Um, the support is superb. And also during interviews with their clientele, um, the the subjects were the subjects mentioned the NGOs and commended them over and over for the great supports that they offer. So when I when I asked each one of them, and I think I've now interviewed nine people that have been sent to me from Grand Chap, um, including one male um, who's whose download I just sent off this morning, when I asked the question, where do you go when you feel you need help of any kind, um, when, when you need to make a report, when you need to seek justice, um, just who do you turn to? And every one of them said, to my agency. None of them would go to the hospital, to a medical clinic, certainly not to the police. They go to their agency. And I think that speaks volumes for the work of NGOs. Uh, well, at least that NGO. No, every, every NGO. Um, I, it is, it is a, a very um, important responsibility and mandate that they clearly need to fill in these small islands and these two are doing it anyway um, on the other hand I've I've also reached out to NGOs who who are teetering on the brink of existence because they don't have enough money they don't have enough resources and those as you might expect are not able to deliver promises at all I think that when I approach them um, because of the sort of epic nature of this project and that it's EU funded um, they want to get on board um, and I want to help them get on board but what it is is that I have deadlines to meet and those take precedence over my now having to turn around and try to help the agencies that I'm seeking help from so those NGOs that have not been able to deliver on their promises because of their of their scant resources. I've had to sort of, I, mean, I guess it would seem aggressively move away from and move on, um, hoping that there is another time um, when I can go back to them and we can um, we can correspond again. But for this project at this time, I've had to sort of let go of some things that um, I'll have to pick up another time, right? I hope that's clear. Regarding the sex worker and trafficked women categories, um, I wouldn't like, I would not like to say more than I've said before, but suffice to mention that I found myself and my staff placed at danger because of my interactions with that population, and I'm happy to cease and desist. All right, um, at this time then, full speed ahead. We're at a gallop, trying to meet quota by deadline. Um, I remain optimistic, and I wonder that colleagues overseas don't think that in the Caribbean we're lazing on the beach as they cannot see us sweat, you know. But it is a matter of full gallop at this time, and uh, we're hoping for acceptable results. All for now. So, Lee, how has it been? <sighs> well, you know, the experience has been very interesting. Um, it's been very enlightening, given the fact that we've had a, a wide range of ages. As I told you earlier, we've had from age 16 to up to age 18 men's views on um, domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And as I told you earlier, there's some degree of ambivalence in terms of um, male's perception of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, they speak a lot about provocation in terms of their interactions with females. Yet, 
they are very protective of their women for their mothers, their sisters. So you can see a clear ambivalence in terms of the, the um, concept of domestic violence. Yes. I'm here discussing with um, Lee Rose, who is the researcher for the men. And um, we're really just having a, a catch up on how the interviews have gone. So you're more or less at the end now. Yes, I just have one more group to do. Um, and those are some men from the National Probation Department. Mm -hmm. But um, we've done a number of groups. We've done four, at least four groups so far. Right, so four is the number, um, but I understand that you're doing that fifth group because there were some low numbers yes, 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 in, in, yes. in some of the, the other groups. Yeah? That's correct, yeah. Uh, this report, this interview rather, is going towards my May, June um, monthly report. So, the men's research is coming to an end, but the qualitative research with women continue to be a real challenge for the obvious reasons that the women that we are trying to to get to share their stories are women who are very hard to reach under any circumstances. That's women um, who are living with HIV, women in same-sex relationship, women with disabilities, traffic women and um, when you add domestic violence on top of those vulnerable situations um, it is not unexpected that we were going to have some challenges but nonetheless we continue to put our best foot forward because we intend to reach our target um, in safe and ethical ways, uh, despite the challenges. So Lee, what are you doing now? Basically, um, these are the consent forms and the ranking exercises. I'm compiling them in an orderly fashion for you. And my next steps now are to conclude the transcribing of the interviews of the older gentleman I, I met with last week, mm -hmm. um, and then to just work on the one with the probation department. So that's basically okay. So you've done about half of your mm. transcript. So the, well, yeah, just over half. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And um, you were sharing earlier that you had some some challenges, which is not unknown to the research process. You always have to guard against the unexpected, um, whether it is um, being ha coming down with the flu. <laughs> um, suddenly your um, your PC deciding that it, it is mm -hmm. it has come to the end of its life even yeah. although it might be very very young <laughs> uh, and of course I suppose one of the biggest challenges is that um, you have no control over whether people are going to turn up or not yes that the, was one of my challenges because I had one group, I went and only one person turned up, so I had to reschedule. Yes. You know, so that took time and reorganizing. And that, funny enough, that was the largest group, but that worked out quite well because I met at their office, which wasn't the right. original plan, but so I went to them, so it worked out. Right. Yeah, such a, we had an interesting discussion. So in rescheduling, you you had the biggest of, of all. Mm -hmm. in, so it probably in worked, out, terms. Yeah, yes. worked out fine. I was yes. like nine or ten people. Yes, and you, of course you have no control of that because people are volunteering their time as well as volunteering their stories. So this month has also seen me being involved in making contact with uh, numerous new stakeholders who again have been incredible in terms of the support that they have offered to the uh, none in three research project. Um, in addition to reaching out to additional people, um, I have been re-establishing contact 
with stakeholders to whom we had presented the, the proposal um, earlier in the year, really just to keep in touch with them and to keep them on board as to how the process is going and very importantly what's going to be the next stage. So part of what I have been doing this month is to meet with the project advisory group and um, two very key stakeholders turned up at that meeting that was a representative from the Ministry of Social Care and the Ministry of Education. So despite the low numbers that turned up to that first meeting, um, the key people were there. And I have to say that although we had um, uh, people who were not able to attend, it was for very, very legitimate reasons. It was, it was for really compelling reasons that you really could not predict was going to happen. So the intention was to attend the meeting, uh, but unfortunately at the last minute we only had two members turning up, but there were the two key people, as I just said. I'm now thinking that um, my next PAG meeting will probably be by Skype because it gives people more flexibility in terms of their availability and people are very, very busy. You know, there's so much happening, particularly at this time of the year. Um, certainly where the schools are concerned, it's coming up to exam time. And um, there, there are lots of other things happening in Barbados at this time. So um, we have Skype meetings with people abroad in different countries, so it might be worth it, you know, to see how a Skype meeting of key stakeholders might go um, for our next project advisory group. So um, that is a, a brief synopsis of some of the things that's been happening this month, and um, I'm pleased that I have been able to share my first video <laughs> with me. <laughs> you know, um, it probably is, is I, I hope it turns out all right. Uh, <laughs> and thanks, Lee. Hi, I'm Eunice Ma. I'm professor in digital media and games. Um, we are working on the Work Package 2 of None in 3 project. The aim of the Work Package 2 is to design and develop a series of games to allow the user to raise the awareness of the user of uh, domestic violence as well as uh, change their attitude and behavior. We are in month three of the project. And this is my colleague, uh, David Smith. He's a game developer on this project. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah. Um, so what we've been doing initially for the first month or two was obviously just getting up to speed with kind of like how things are in Barbados and Grenada. I've uh, been doing a lot of reading of the news websites um, and indeed doing some uh, background reading in terms of the literature to do with the project as well to get a better understanding of it. Uh, we've then taken it a bit further from that stage, uh, started to build some sort of prototype um, which is going to it's gonna give the team a better idea of what it is that we're going to be able to make and then we'll go back and forth between obviously the researchers out in uh, Barbados and Grenada uh, and ourselves and we'll keep iterating on this until we end up with a game that will eventually be played by uh, people in the schools and the young institutions as well. Um, so should we take a look at the game itself? Yeah. 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 So we put it there then? Yeah. So at the moment um, we're going for a third person perspective game and the reason we're going to do this is because I feel like it's quite important to express the emotional states of each character uh, and if we were to do this in first person, you would lose um, that insight into like how the character is expressing themselves through body language. Um, so what we've got then is just sort of like one of these opening scenarios. Um, and in this first case, you can actually play as the child. And here you can see the mother. And then you actually we've created like a simple dialogue system um, that's going to allow you to you know choose different responses depending on the situation at hand. Um, so here you can choose to say whether you have or haven't done your homework uh, and then obviously if you choose yes that's a lie because you haven't done it yet 
um, and in that way the mother's then going to respond and shake her head and that's just a really simple example of some dialogue interaction um, and then what's going to happen is um, you know the uh, aggressor in this situation is going to come in um, and force you to go to bed um, and at that point you have the opportunity to then you know move to your room and then explore the house a little further um, building up a greater understanding if you know what the um, characters themselves are like by actually exploring the environment and finding out more information about them. Okay. Yeah. So we just keep on carry on what we're doing and yeah. later we can edit that. Mm -hmm. um, so the software has been so the Unity. Yeah. Yeah. And they they also make the purchase order for the Mocha. perception. Yeah, perception neuron. neuron. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully it will arrive in three, four days. Oh wow, that's fast. Yeah, that's good. That's what she said. I've got to admit, um, it will be a huge help because at the moment, because we're only using the ones off of Mixamo, mm -hmm. uh, we're quite limited in terms of the animations. So I'm sure you can see, this is literally just a stock bartending animation she does. Hold on a second. So when, after she's done shaking her head and gesturing to the homework, she'll turn back around. And that's just kind of like, that's obviously just for now supposed to imply that she's doing some washing up. Yeah. But until, until obviously we get our own motion capture in there, we're going to really struggle to get those transitions right. Uh, and the same for Rondell, I've just got a simple idle, I found a gesture of him going that. But what he really should do is go, you, go to bed now, and that should be a lot more in sync. But obviously because we're limited by the animations at the moment, um, you know, we're a little bit slower on that front. Uh, but I did this week, um, I actually redid the cat child character um, because I had a few inconsistencies in the model. So let's have a look at the child. So I feel like this one's a little bit more detailed in the face. Mm -hmm. Doesn't look quite as cartoony. Um, or at least it didn't in the uh, Fuse character editor as well. Um, and that's got all the animation set back up on it. Um, so again, you can walk. It's a little bit out on the movement at the moment. Um, Rondell uh, is now in as well. He's got a full animation tree and set two. Let's have a look at characters. So yeah, he's just got a really simple tree at the moment. We trigger out a um, this is an unacceptable head shake at the there's too much salt in the meal line. And then when that animation is complete, we're just going to the gesture you go to bed now, and then there's a um, on animation complete trigger. And what that does is that just basically calls into my event system. Oops, I can't move it when we're playing. So, let's see. Uh, we set Diana up with the animation, set the kid up, run the dialogue tree, um, and then whether or not you answered honestly or wrongly, the animation tree for Diana, either she either shakes her head or just gestures to the homework. Uh, and the trigger runs off, um, Diana leans on the counter somewhere, there I think it is, um, and then obviously Rondell tells the child to go to bed, which obviously we think we're going to name Joe for that, um, both genders coverage, because that way we don't have to do the voice lines for both. Um, yep, yeah, and then they stood up, re-enabled the controls, so Rondell got in, Diana got in with animation set, uh, child got in. I just need to build um, a node that allows me to move the camera like I was doing before. I don't have that access to that in here yet. That will only take me a little while to run into that source control error. So that camera will follow Joe? Yeah, although I'm thinking I might just pan it to here to point the player in the right direction, whereas if it just follows them it might go a bit... Um, it's going to depend, I guess, on how it feels to play. Do you have some control camera control that uh, allow uh, we see so we can the actual character, just like what know. actual follow, as in camera following the character. Because uh, what I was going to do see, is print like, out to like, say, like in say in some role role playing game, you have different control. Some control are control the para character to moving, mm -hmm. and other control are control the camera, so you can actually. Turn the camera to see the character. Oh, right. So you, know you can rotate the camera around the player, so yeah. orbiting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so it works in larger environments, that sort of a system, but I'm just a little 
concerned because obviously we still got these and I mean I do need to obviously make these wider but these narrow corridors and if you've got like no, okay. the ability to rotate the camera the camera might uh, intersect with a wall yeah mm -hmm. which is why I was gonna at least for this first bit while you're just learning the controls a bit um, mm -hmm. I was just gonna have the camera steer you in the right direction too so that the mm -hmm. camera would probably end up somewhere like this We've obviously Rondell stood there looking at you, and then you could. Yeah, because I'm I'm thinking of the the outdoor environment in mm. the market. Oh like yeah, so to, case two. Yeah. Yeah. Because we want to show off. I like that. So to be able to be a bit more free roam, I'm just not sure it's going to work. Indoor. Indoors, especially in these close environments, we've got. Mm. It might do. It might work a try, but obviously because it's point and click as well. Mm -hmm. Um having a rotatable camera on that, unless we did it like you say with the arrow keys, so you could turn with the arrow keys and then click. Um, but for this first case, because I'm trying to very specifically get the player to like go to the bedroom, okay. um, and then obviously come back, I was going to use moderately fixed camera angles that would then just move bit by bit and track the player as they walk down the corridor. So I mean, what I might do is get it to track the player as they walk down here, but then obviously as they get closer to the door, smoothly transition out to one that focuses on the door. Um, and so on. Um, so I also got my DIY on, so to speak, and mm -hmm. um, built some kitchen some panels. Yeah, yeah, I am particularly pleased with this. I think this went really well. Um, obviously not textured, um, but they are in there. They are all perfectly to scale. They're a little bit modular, so you know you can mix and match. So if we do need a kitchen further on down the line, uh -huh. I've got the pieces ready to go. Uh, the sink, I do need Can to tap Can they be still. animated? Have you have the... The doors could be animated. Yeah, they could be. Um, I've separated them out in such a way that they could be done. Yeah. I would have to make a hollow version of this kitchen unit. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I have technically already done that for the sink, but I'd obviously need to adapt it a little bit so that it works for that too. Um, but yeah, it, it is totally possible to actually get those every door to animate. I would like to do things like have players be able to like open the fridge and yeah. look inside the fridge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, because I mean, especially when you're dealing with like small, incredibly focused environments like this, you've got to have as much. Are, are they kitchen chair? They are going to be kitchen chairs. Yeah, okay. they're just placeholder sizes, mm -hmm. really. Um, obviously, I didn't want to go into too much detail when I was building a placeholder, but yeah, they are just going to be chairs. Okay. Um, that's the only real usable space. So obviously, I was going to have something like a television there, and then the child just playing in front of the television, because obviously this sofa is going to be there. Um, and then that would obviously make a lot of sense in terms of the layout of the room. Um, you, you got the scenario from Hazel, have you? From Hazel? No, yeah. I haven't heard a word no. actually. No. Not yet. No. Oh, okay. Mm, last we saw. Promise. Give me till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Um, so yeah, uh, I feel like it's getting there. I mean, I've got the three characters in. Um, the animations are in. Yeah, so you, you need to get uh, all the furniture texture. Yeah, I need to get them textured. Oh. I need to do the rest of the kitchen cupboards. I need to do the rest of the models for the actual scene itself. Uh -huh. um, the environment, environment models. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it'll look a lot better once we get rid of these. Um, but I didn't want to be cheap and just whack a texture on it for the sake of... Because mm -hmm. the thing about the grid is it helps me visualize the sense of scale of it but as soon as you take the grid away it becomes a lot harder so I mean I'm nearly done now anyway in terms of laying things out but so and after that we're really waiting for stories um, the, the yeah so um, I mean obviously the dialogue for case one scene one I can get on with that no problem um, and that's just a case of getting that finished um, how, how are you going to present those dialogue the dialogue, you mean yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, overhaul the UI? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've looked at quite a few options um, and it seemed like the most common ways of doing it were... It's kind of... Uh, you either have a, yeah. the entire text box all the way along the bottom and yeah. then your responses underneath, or uh -huh. you can have it here. Uh -huh. there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with having it here, it's just obviously it has to be differentiated from the background, so there will have to be a dark semi-transparent box behind it. Uh -huh. uh, to make it readable, because obviously if that ceiling was white, you'd never read it, um, and things like that. Um, but yeah, that is also one of my concerns, and it does work. So, so would you prefer it down there, is that what you're saying? I don't know. Most of, most of the dialogue system... Because all I did really was I just went... 
Well, you, you have some dialogue system on, on one side oh, of right. the screen, yeah. and others at the bottom. And this part is, is a bit rare. Mm? No, normally it's either there or, or at the bottom, is it? Yeah, I saw something like this. Um, not that one though, that's obviously just a cheap version. But I was looking at dialogue system. In, in And some uh, like kind that. of lock pop up bubble or something like that. Mm. Um, so, what you're saying, the bubbles come out of the characters themselves? or? Yeah. Mm. Well, what do you think is the best? So, what I was trying to do with this is because we don't know, again, if this is ever going to come to tablet or anything, but like it's quite scalable, it's quite clear to read. My worry is, is if I was to take this and put it down here, mm. that's almost half the screen taken up with dialogue uh, because you don't know how many options you're going to have and I could I can make it dynamic so that obviously if you've only got two options um, if you put that way or that save space it might save space but it also mess with the framing of elements too um, well you don't you don't um, change anything there but uh, as a kind of uh, on-screen display on, right. on top of that let's see Sketchbook out. You know the rest are all three D, mm -hmm. but the the UI is two D. It's a part of a uh, OSD on screen display. Yeah. Semi transparent or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment we've got. And you're thinking, where would you have the main... So there's two elements of play, isn't there? There's the options that you can have, and then there's whatever somebody last said. Yeah. So where would you put the main dialogue that was just spoken? Um, well, there's several options. You can either on top of his or her head as a... Oh, right, thing. so like an in-world element. Yeah. Okay which attached to his head, but above several pixels or whatever. Okay. And these, because normally, say if you have four or five, like multiple choice, this is the layout is more kind of tall yeah. than wide. I think. Is it? Okay, guys, welcome back. Uh, now we'll talk about the uh, perpendicular score matching, which is a, a, a very useful technique for uh, testing the, uh, the effectiveness of certain treatment when your sample is not randomly assigned to the groups, to control and treatment group. So, ideally, when you run a true randomized experiment, you need to control and a treatment group, and the, uh, the, the, the both groups are randomly selected from, from the larger population. And once you, once you get this randomized control, uh, this randomized uh, uh, control trial, you don't need to worry about anything. You can look at the uh, effect of treatment on certain dependent variables. Now, like I said, this normally happens when you randomly assign people to treatment and control group. If the groups are large enough, the distribution of pre-treatment characteristics, I'll talk about this later, what I mean by saying pre-treatment characteristics, in the two groups should be identical. So any difference in the outcome can be attributed to the treatment. This is why we randomly select peop uh, people to treatment condition in the control group. Now, what if these two groups are not randomly selected? What if they pre-selected? based on certain characteristics. Now, uh, we refer to this issue as a selection bias. And we say that it's not a, a, a true experiment because uh, the treatment could be affected by something which happened before the treatment or any characteristics, personal characteristics of participants. So, why we do observational study without random selection because in most of the cases randomized trial may be unethical 
or unfeasible, impractical, and not scientifically justified. Just give you an example from one research I used to work on when I was a, 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 a lecturer at the, at the Royal College of Surgeon back in Dublin. We were looking at the effectiveness of smoking on lung cancer and heart disease. Now, <laughs> it wasn't a true randomized control of uh, the, the study because you can't just grab a, a bunch of people and randomly select into treatment and control group, right? You can't make people to smoke for three or six months to see how it is going to affect their body, right? The health. So, we use pre-selected groups. We have a group of smokers, people who smoke for it for, for I don't know, three months, six months, or 10 years, 20 years, and then we had control group non smokers. They were not randomly selected to groups. They were pre-selected based on smoking habits. Now, here's the thing. We look at the uh, how smoking can affect a lung cancer. But we know that some people are genetically predisposed to lung cancer, or any cancer, or heart disease. So sometimes smoking is not the cause of the, uh, 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 the cancer. So what we did, we control the background characteristics, things like personality and exercise and you know a lot of stuff. Just make sure the control group, those known smokers and non and, and treatment group uh, uh, smokers, were actually pretty much the same based on all background characteristics. So the only difference between control and the experimental group was smoking treatment. So this is a perfect application of propensity score matching. matching. Now, what is propensity score matching? Well, it, it is quite difficult to explain statistically. I'm, just, I'm, I'm going to try and make it very simple and translate the complicated idea into simple language, English language. Here's the thing. A propensity score is a conditional probability of receiving the exposure or certain event occurring given a set of observed covariates. Now, in other words, it's a probability that someone will be in treatment group given his or her specific characteristics. I know it's, <laughs> it's not quite clear, but let me ask you a question. Did you get the point? Dominic, did you get a point? I did. I, it. I did. You probably <laughs> did. <laughs> well, okay, I appreciate that. But if you got it, I, I'm not expecting you to get a point at this stage because it will make quite, I make it very simple when we go actually to practical session and we do the whole thing in R and I show you the data and example. But before we get there, the goal, I mean, why are we using propensity score margin? Why are we using propensity score analysis? The goal is to simulate randomized controlled trial as much as possible. We're trying to match treatment and control group based on the covariance as best as we can. Make them similar, make them look like they were randomly selected to treatment and control group. Subjects, participants in the exposure group versus those in no exposure group may be very, very different in baseline characteristics. We call them observed covariates. So, use propensity score, we use a single number in order to match subjects in each group based on observed covariates. Like I said, it's gonna, it's gonna be quite easy when I share this on example later on. So, there's a couple things, uh, well I call this a, 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 a good research practice with the use of propensity score analysis. Three things you need to remember before we do anything. First thing, we need to have a clear, ambiguous definition of treatment variable. So, for example, you know, the, the research I conducted back in Ireland, smokers, known smokers. That's very clear. Now, we need to include covariates that are temporally prior to treatment. So here's the thing. When I look at the, at the, at the smoking and no smoking group, I had to make sure that actually they matched they pretty much the same on covariates which were measured before they actually approached the experiment. They were invited to experiment. And the last thing, we need to demonstrate the balance of covariates before and after matching techniques. This I will explain in details in, in, in a couple of minutes. 
So, propensity score matching based on our current research, just to let you know for those who are not familiar with what we do at the moment, Dominic, uh, Nikki, and I, we're involved in, in a European Union project. It's called Not in Three Preventing Domestic Violence. So I'll give you a, 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 I won't be talking about project, of course, this is the uh, training about, about propensity score matching. But, you know, I'll just give you an example of what we're planning to do, you know, using propensity score matching uh, uh, within this project. So, uh, the study we're involved uh, 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 investigates the effectiveness of game exposure on attitudes and behavior change. Like I said, let, I won't be going into details, let's just focus on statistics, on, on research matters. Ideally, here's the thing, ideally, the predictive effect, effect would be assessed by randomly assigning individuals to treatment, exposure to game, and control group, which is lack of exposure to game. So that the effect of background characteristics on the outcome variable, which is behavior change, attitude change, empathy increase, and so on and so on. So the outcome variable could be controlled for it. Well, let me tell you something, it's quite impossible. You can't just go to the school and ask and randomly select children to the treatment control group. In other words, you know, deprive a part of the students of the treatment. It's not ethical. This is not what we do, and this is not what we, what we this is what we want to do. So what we're gonna do, we'll go to the Caribbean islands and select schools for uh, for the for the participation. So we're gonna systematically select in a primary and secondary schools and assign them to control and the uh, treatment group. But we need to make sure the children coming from, from two different schools, they're pretty much the same on background characteristics. That's why we'll be using propensity score matching. So, our key independent variable here in this project is the treatment. The treatment is a game exposure. It's a binary indicator for game exposure. So this treatment variable, this independent variable, will be coded one or zero. You either were exposed to the, 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 to the, the, the treatment game and, or not. And our dependent variable is a behavior, well actually we've got a number of dependent variables, right? So one of them is a behavior change, the other is if the other is an attitude change or some behavior intentions, there's going to be some attitudes to violence and, and empathy, and there's a lot of stuff there. Now, the, the covariates, the, the stuff, okay, the variables we will be, we'll be controlling in this model, you know, making sure that both groups are pretty much the same, are age of participants, gender, social economic status, location, living conditions, Empathy, when we talk about empathy, we'll, be, we'll focus on four dimensional aspects of empathy. Emotional intelligence, hopelessness, exposure to violence, violence perpetration, violence victimization, perceived prevalence about adolescent violence, hence hostility. As long as we're sure that both groups are pretty much the same on all these covariates, we can say that the game exposure makes some effect or not. The real effect of the game exposure. Okay, <clears throat> so enough about our background about the project. Now let's go to the methods. How we do this? So this is just a theory, and, and in, in, in the next session I'll show you how to do it in R using my data, which I collected in America uh, uh, b -b -b using some uh, b -b 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 some criminal data. I mean. I was to conduct some research among gangsters, youth offenders on streets. The first stage, in order, well, in order to, to, to run propensity or matching, first you need to make sure that your covariate, your variables, these covariates, have certain bounds. Okay? That means that the control and the experimental group are pretty much the same on, on the background characteristics. So we call this a checking covariate balance before matching. Now, assessing how close the covariate distribution are in the two groups is no balance. And here's the uh, equation for that, how to run it. Don't worry about it. You don't have to do it anything by hand. But in the 21st century, we've got computers. And I was kind enough to actually translate this quite complicated for someone uh, 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 equation into syntax in, in R. I'll show you that later. 
So uh, this is the uh, an example from my research, like I like said, you know, the, the one with the gangsters. When I look at the uh, <clears throat> a number of covariates, I make sure that the uh, gangsters and no gangsters are pretty much the same on a number of covariates. Now, Rosenbaum and um, Rubin suggested that standardized absolute difference equal or greater to 20% is indication of imbalance. So what you really want in your data, the difference between control and experimental group is something less than 20%. Okay? Well, actually, some researchers say 10% when you, when you go to the medical research. But let, let's just stick with, uh, with the social sciences. So let's just have a look at this, at, at this example here. We see that their age is 7.7. .7. Well, that's no problem, right? It's less than 20%. I mean, the difference between control and experimental group is fine. However, ethnicity, 76%. Hmm, that's a problem. Then we got, what, what else we got? I mean, let's just focus on the big ones. Violence victimization, 80%. Violence witness, 66%. Psychopathy, both factors, over 20%. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's, 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 it's quite obvious that, that these two groups are different, totally different on background characteristics. So, conclusion, we need to match them. We need to use probiotic score matching. Okay, so next step, once you know that, the, that, 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 there, there is, that the both groups are not quite the same, you need to calculate the propensity score. Now, you can use any statistical software you know, and available, SPSS or Stata or R, to calculate <coughs> a, a, a binary logistic regression. While we'll be doing the whole experiment, the whole uh, training in R, of course, because it's, 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 it, it combines the propensity score calculation with the matching. Because you can't do matching in, in SPSS. So, you need to specify a model with all covariates, all these predictors, these variables I mentioned before. Now, group membership here is a dependent variable, so it's our treatment variable. And the predicted probability value in your propensity score is your, sorry, the predicted, predicted probability, I need some water, I think. The predicted probability is your, is your propensity score. So, here's the thing. Third step. Once you get a, a, once you calculated propensity score, the probability of being assigned to a treatment group based on certain covariates. So once you got the single number and you got control group and, 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 and treatment group participants, you try to match them based on this propensity score. Simple? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Probability score matching, for example, after calculating the probability score for each youth, this is what we're going to do in our non trait project, a matching procedure will be employed to match those who are exposed to gain and those who are not exposed, exposed to the gain. Now, before we do probability score matching, I'll tell you about a number of techniques. We've got a different number of techniques in terms of matching participants. Well, there, well, there's more than four. I mean, this is the four basic techniques. The first one is called optimal matching. The second is nearest neighborhood matching, sometimes called greedy matching. And we've got subclassification about propensity score and full matching. I don't recommend the full matching for a number of reasons, which I'm going to cover tomorrow. Okay. So. In our research, and my research so far, I only apply greedy matching. When I match one participant from treatment group to one participant from control group based on this propensity score. And this is what we're going to do in Norman 3. Just to let you know, guys. Okay. Now, this is how you present the uh, characteristic of unmatch and match. A sample. Actually, to be honest, I will not focus on this table now. We'll do this after we, 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 we after our practical session. Uh, it's gonna it, it's gonna make more sense for you guys. So, uh, balance improvement after matching. Here's the thing: to calculate the percentage difference in bias reduction for originally imbalanced variables and following procedure. The following procedure is used. This, of course, taken from from 
from, uh, from, uh, from mathematicians. So this is the equation. Like I said, don't worry about it. You don't have to calculate by hand. I translate the whole thing in syntax, which I will provide you later on. Okay? But once you calculate the balance improvement, you need to actually show that in table as well. So when you go to my example, you see, you remember, there was the, the, the control group and the treatment group were hugely mad. There were, there were, there were huge difference you know, on number of covariates. And let's have a look what happened after applying nearest neighborhood margin. Here's the thing. Age improved? No, it didn't. It's actually got worse. But that's not a big deal. I'll show the layer. <laughs> okay? But the rest of the variables improve. Ethnicity improved 68%. The gender improved 77%. Every single variable here improved over 50%, which is a great achievement. And this shows you that without propensity score matching, this research, I mean the results <coughs> you obtain without propensity score matching are not real, not true. Here's the thing. Once you show the balance improvement, you need to check again after matching procedure and make sure that the balance between control and your ready, I mean based on my previous experiment, and, <clears throat> and after matching, here we, we got the, the data, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we got data before matching here, this column, and data after matching. We see the age was 7.7, .7. now it's 0.9. It's much better. We see that ethnicity was 76, it's 26.99. Okay, it's not below 20%, but it's a huge improvement from 76% down to 26 or almost 27%. Now, gender was 20%, it was just there, right? But now it's 6.6%. This is fantastic. Now, same things right away was 28%, now it's 13%. Part of the fighting was 27%, now it's 12%. Family rest, there was huge, 49%, now it's 8.3%. Same thing with, with, the, with the rest of the variables. Okay? Every single variable, I mean balance, has been improved. So, conclusion, the propensity score matching is a great success in this particular example. Now, just to summarize, before I go to the specific example and before I show you how to do things step by step in details, you need to remember one thing. What we're we doing here, we're looking on the treatment, how treatment has an effect on certain dependent variables. And remember guys, sometimes, as I said before, if control and experimental group are not randomly selected, you need to control for pre-treatment characteristics, and this is propensity score matching. Once you control based on this covariance, once you match participants from control and the treatment group, you can look at how treatment has an effect on certain dependent variable without randomized control. I mean, without ran <laughs> randomization. So now I'm going to show you how to do things uh, in, in R. Okay. Hi, this is our media report for the month of June 2016. The theme for this month is elder abuse and this has been sparked by a recent incident that happened here in Barbados um, with an elderly person as it relates to domestic violence. We interviewed a couple of persons within the society and then took those interviews and compiled it into a video on domestic violence as it relates to the elderly. There is an added method to our social media strategy and that has reaped very good results and we've gotten a lot of feedback. So that method is one that we will continue to use as the project continues for the next two years. Um, we did a feature on Mental Health Awareness Week um, and posted sort of various infographics um, around top 10 tips for managing mental health, the best things you can do and where you can get support from. Uh, and I think they were really quite popular and something I'd like to keep sort of targeting or developing. I'm trying to find some data, particularly around the elder, um, elderly abuse, 
uh, and also potentially social work factors um, and I'm happy to create some infographics it's something that I do as part of my role at work uh, so if we if anyone has got data it'd be really useful if they could uh, share that with me and then I can sort of do the infographics and share them um, I also so I've started using uh, the hashtags that we talked about before, so Motivational Monday, Time for Change Tuesday. They've been really useful in giving a bit of direction to posts, but I don't think they're too restrictive, so it's still um, still quite easy to, to post relevant material, but it gives a bit more form and a bit more structure to the content that we're posting. I've also seen that you were posting similar things on the Facebook page, which I think is brilliant, and it's it feels very cohesive to me at the moment, sort of how we're sharing the hashtags feels like a very there's a, a nice flow to it and it's a very cohesive sort of movement within the project which I'm happy about. I'm focusing as well on elderly um, abuse. I'm also planning to do a post around the Orlando um, shootings that, we, that took place sort of over the weekend um, but still keeping the focus on elderly abuse and using those hashtags to link with it um, and that's really sort of the focus for the next few weeks. Uh, and then I know we've talked about doing um, social posts about social work and domestic violence, which I'll also look at. So I will keep you updated on the uh, states of the accounts and also uh, if I find any any useful data that we can post through social media. As well, in relation to social media, we also have a new Instagram account and it is none in three with underscores in between each word so you would now find us on none underscore in underscore three and this is on instagram and you will hear more about the instagram account in the future from our media team member megan kenny plans are underway and progressing very well with the conference which is to be held here in barbados and a press release is currently being produced for distribution in regards to this our focus for the coming month will be social workers' views on domestic violence and this will be a compilation of interviews from Barbados and Grenada. As it relates to the film, what we will say for now is that it is based around the serious game which is currently being developed by the game design team. And that's the media report for June 2016. Thank you.